This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We're talking about the life and the suicide of Aaron Swartz, 26-year-old cyber activist, social justice activist who committed suicide last Friday. Um, I want to turn to Aaron's comments made at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in October 2010. He was talking about the nonprofit subscription service that so many college students and others use around the country called JSTOR. I am going to give you one example of something not as big as saving Congress, but something important that you can do right here at your own school. It just requires you willing to get your shoes a little bit money. By virtue of being students at a major U.S. university, I assume that you have access to a wide variety of scholarly journals. Pretty much every major university in the United States pays these sort of licensing fees to organizations like JSTOR and Thompson and ISI to get access to scholarly journals that the rest of the world can't read. And these licensing fees are substantial, and they're so substantial that people who are studying in India instead of studying in the United States don't have this kind of access. They're locked out from all of these journals. They're locked out from our entire scientific legacy. I mean, a lot of these journal articles, they go back to the Enlightenment. Every time someone has written down a scientific paper, it's been scanned and digitized and put in these collections. That is a legacy that has been brought to us by the history of people doing interesting work, the history of scientists. It's a legacy that should belong to us as a commons, as a people, but instead, it's been locked up and put online by a handful of for-profit corporations who then try and get the maximum profit they can out of it. Now, there are people, good people, trying to change this with the open access movement. So all journals going forward, they're encouraging them to publish their work as open access, open on the internet, available for download by everybody, available for free copying and perhaps even modification with attribution and notice. That was Aaron Swartz in 2010, speaking at the University of uh, Illinois. Um, our guests are Taryn Steinbruckner Kaufman, Aaron's partner, head of SomeOfUs.org, and Alex Stamos, Artemis Internet, planned to testify on Aaron's behalf during his trial, would have been the chief defense witness. Alex, talk about the significance of what Aaron was saying two years ago. Well, Aaron believed uh, very strongly, as he said, that the uh, scientific and cultural background uh, that has been built over the centuries belonged to everyone. Um, and obviously, he was willing to, to risk a lot uh, to, to test that um, and to, to test the, the walls that had been put up around this content, as he called them. Talk about how you came to be involved in this case. I mean, usually you're working for companies like Goldman Sachs, protecting them. Um, talk about why you were going to be the chief defense witness. I actually knew very little about Aaron's case, other than what I had read online uh, casually, uh, until I was contacted last fall by his new attorneys that were here in San Francisco. Um, as you said, we, we mostly do corporate work. Aaron was actually our first criminal defendant. Uh, and generally, this is not the kind of work that interests us or has a, an interesting uh, computer security aspect. Uh, but when we were contacted by the lawyers, it did intrigue us uh, that he was facing such serious charges uh, for, even if you believe all the facts in the government in indictment, uh, ac actions that are very difficult to really qualify as computer hacking. Um, and so we, we decided to, to join the case as expert witnesses. Um, and as the, the case went on, uh, that belief that what he did uh, is, is very hard to fit into that box that they tried to fit in of, of criminal hacking activity, uh, you know, that, that feeling grew as we saw the evidence and went to MIT, talked to witnesses, and, and saw the case the government was laying out against him. And again, what exactly was it that he did that you would say does not qualify as computer hacking? And, and why would you say the uh, what would be the line that you would draw uh, on this? And uh, and also your speculation as to why the government even pursued this case, if you have a, a, a theory, uh, why they felt so strongly that they had to pursue him. So. Aaron was accused of, as been discussed a couple times, downloading too many files, of checking too many books out of the library. Um, he found a loophole that he that was a convenient way for him to 
get access to a lot of the JSTOR documents. And that, that loophole is the fact that MIT made two interesting decisions. First, MIT decided to license the JSTOR database in a way where access was provided to the entire MIT network um, without asking for any kind of individual authentication. That's often not true with JSTOR databases at a lot of universities and actually today at MIT. Uh, if, if you want to access JSTOR and you, you have that affiliation, you have to say, I'm Bob Smith, uh, I'm a student, um, and the university authenticates that's who you are. Uh, and so now you have an identity with JSTOR where they can monitor what you're doing and, and see how many downloads you have. Uh, MIT didn't have that set up. They wanted a setup that was completely open for people just to go to the JSTOR website, be able to click on a document and read it. Um, and, and that's the, the deal they made with JSTOR. The other decision that MIT made was that they decided to run an extremely open, unmonitored network um, in, in a method that allowed people to jump on from wire, wireless or wired access points all over the campus uh, and take on the identity of, a, of somebody affiliated with MIT. This is an intentional decision. They allow visitors, they allow uh, people who just happen to be on campus this access, uh, and, and they do so with, with very little need to authenticate um, or, or say who, who you are. And so those things combined, Aaron realized, would allow him to go onto campus uh, and to, to download articles from a variety of, of locations. Uh, you know, I, I can't actually condone everything Aaron did. I think, uh, as I've written online, I, I think what he did uh, was perhaps, you know, discourteous or uh, inconsiderate of taking advantage of the you know, uh, library privileges that he was basically granted. Uh, but at no time did he actually do any actions that I would consider hacking. Uh, what Aaron did is he went to MIT and he started downloading uh, documents uh, and JSTOR at, at some point noticed a lot of documents were being downloaded from one address at MIT. And so they would cut off that address uh, Aaron would notice, and then just ask the MIT network to give him a new one. That's a pretty common thing. It's something that people do, uh, you know, all all day at university and corporate, or even like on a Starbucks wi Wi-Fi network. Um, and it's that action, though, of going and requesting new identity that the government seems to consider wire fraud or or computer fraud. Um, it probably one of the things that he did that that brought it to a head was in the end, uh, Aaron, I, I. Believe this was his, his motivation. Wanted to to find a place that he could leave his laptop for for several days um, to continue downloading without him having to be there. Uh, and so he opened up and went into an unlocked wiring closet and plugged his computer into a switch. Um, that MIT was calling trespassing, and that's kind of uh, the activity that allowed them to catch him. Um, and 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 seems to be where they believe he he massively overstepped the line. But at no time, even during that, would he do anything that I would consider hacking. We should say that JSTOR um, refused to endorse any prosecution of Aaron Swartz, the not-for-profit service member of the Internet community, um, and said uh, Aaron returned the data he had in his possession, and JSTOR settled any civil claims we might have had against him in June 2011. And uh, earlier this week, before Aaron died, um, they announced, JSTOR announced, um, that uh, 1,200 journals from its archive had been opened for limited reading by the public. Starin, uh, Taryn Steinbrickner Kaufman, uh, Aaron's partner, still with us from Washington, D.C., just flew back from Chicago, where she attended Aaron's funeral. Can you talk about the broader issues here? I think that there are a couple of broader issues that, that Aaron's, you know, senseless prosecution and, and death uh, highlight. And one is, of course, this, this freedom of information issue, an open access issue that, that the sci as, as, as the clip you played of Aaron says, that, you know, the scientific legacy of academics and researchers from over the centuries, often most of it funded in one way or another by taxpayers and by the government. Um, ought to be available to everybody in the world. It ought to be available. And that's one of the things that, you know, that I think, that I, I hope will someday, not just research going forward, but all research ever in history ought to be put up for open access online. Um, the second is this issue of, of how the law addresses uh, computer crimes or, or alleged computer crimes, and that 
you know, the, the law, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act is so broadly written and so amb ambiguous that prosecutors like Steve Hyman, who just want, as I said earlier, just want notches on their belt, uh, can throw the book, can, can charge somebody like Aaron with 35 years in prison for mildly inconsiderate behavior. And the, the, the third issue is, is the broader problems in our criminal justice system. Why does someone like Steve Hyman have the power to do this, unbridled power? Um, why would you charge somebody with up to 35 years in prison if you actually think that, that all they deserve is six months, as the plea deal suggested? That, and this happens to people every day in our system, and most of them have many fewer resources than Aaron. Um, and, and much less support, and don't have the option necessarily even of considering hiring a lawyer and going to trial over the course of two years, and, and are forced to take the plea deals when they're not guilty or when the plea deals are completely unjust. Um, and I think that we need, we need broad criminal justice reform in this country. Um, we incarcerate more people uh, per capita than any other country in the world, and we don't see lower crime rates because of it. There's, there's justice, and then there's justice. And, and right now, we're not, our system does not promote justice. Our system is punitive. Our system is Kafkaesque. Our system is unfair. And Aaron and, and millions of other people suffer because of it. Yeah, I, I wanted to, uh, following up on that, I wanted to refer to uh, comments of uh, the House Oversight Committee Chairman uh, uh, Daryl Issa, who's a Republican of California, who says he wants to launch into an investigation into how the U.S. Attorney's Office press charges against uh, uh, Aaron for, for downloading these articles. He told the Huffington Post, uh, quote, had Aaron been a journalist and taken that same material that he gained from MIT, he would have been praised for it. It would have been like the Pentagon Papers. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this whole issue of uh, prosecutorial overreach on computer crimes, I'm wondering uh, if Alex, uh, uh, Alex Stamos, you might uh, want to comment on that. Yeah, uh, Taryn's got a, a good point. One of the, the key problems here uh, are the definitions in the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, and there's this one word that is very difficult for even those of us who work professionally in this area to understand. And that word is authorized. Uh, you know, uh, multiple of counts in the indictment against Aaron uh, existed because they said that he had exceeded what he was authorized to do either on the MIT network or the JSTOR network. Um, and the term authorized in an internet context, uh, it, it makes a lot less sense than it does in the real world. Uh, you know, for example, I'm sure there are thousands of people right now going to democracy or uh, democracynow.org watching the live stream. Did you authorize any of those people to, to do that, to interact with your computer, to take on the cost that you were taking of streaming that video to them? No, you, you didn't. Um, and of course, they're allowed to and you want them to. But, but how you express that authorization to them uh, is a, a very difficult thing. And at what point does somebody doing something that is allowed become in excess of authorization? Uh, what Aaron was doing was exactly the same activity that thousands of people do at MIT every year. He was going and looking at documents. Now, he was doing it at a much wider scale. He did it more than they seemed to, to want. But at what point does he exceed authorization? Uh, and by having these incredibly broad uh, definitions and a word that doesn't really mean anything like authorized, uh, we, we end up in a situation where if a prosecutor doesn't like you or doesn't like what you did, if it happened to use a computer, they can find a way to call it hacking and a, a, an abuse of, abuse of that system. And just as we went to broadcast today, the grassroots organization Demand Progress, which Aaron Swartz helped found, launched a new campaign calling on Congress to end prosecutorial abuses and to pass Congressmember Zoe Lofgren's bill amending computer fraud law. The group sent a letter to members reading, quote, We are sad, we're tired, we're frustrated, and we're angry at a system that let this happen to Aaron. We and Aaron's friends and family have been in touch with lawmakers to ask for help. We're asking them to help reign in a criminal justice system run amok. Authorities are encouraged to bring frivolous charges and hold decades of jail time over the heads of people accused of victimless crimes, unquote. 
more information on the campaign is at demandprogress.org. And as we wrap up, Taryn, what your plans are, um, uh, what this campaign will mean. I know there'll be a memorial service for Aaron Swartz uh, at Cooper Union at 4 o'clock on Saturday here in New York City. Um, where this campaign is headed? Well, look, I think that the, the best legacy that the best tribute we can pay to Aaron's legacy is to continue to fight as hard as we can to make this world a more just, fairer place. That's the thing that he cared most about. And I'm going to keep doing that. I think that, you know, that, that Aaron's law, um, we, we've yet to sort of uh, look at all of the details of the law, and I want to make sure that it covers, that it's as, as sweeping a, a, an amendment as possible. Uh, but clearly, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act must be amended. Um, and I also hope that this can serve as a wake-up call for the broader issues in the criminal justice system. It's not just this one act. Our system is deeply, deeply unfair. And as I said earlier, millions of people suffer because of it needlessly. And I hope that, you know, this, in, in this country, it's very hard for people to for politicians to look weak on crime, but that's not what this is. This is this is about justice, and a, and and nobody should have to face what Aaron faced. And I hope we can help save people in the future. Taryn Steinbrickner Kaufman, I want to thank you very much for being with us again. Our condolences on the death of your partner, Aaron Swartz. Uh, Taryn is head of someofus.org. Alex Stamos, thanks for joining us from Stanford University, um, head of Artemis Internet, uh, was going to be one of the chief witnesses, defense witnesses, at Aaron's uh, trial. Of course, after his death, uh, the U.S. prosecutor announced all the charges were dropped. And by the way, if you'd like to go to our website, um, we authorize all of you to go to democracynow.org, read, watch, listen to our shows, read the transcripts. On Monday, we devoted the whole show to Aaron's case as well. We played uh, the speech he just recently gave uh, in Washington, D.C., at the Freedom to Connect conference. And you can go to democracynow.org. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.